It's time for the Susan Taylor Podcast, where we discuss the yoga of mind, medicine, and healing. Author of Feeling Good Matters, Sexual Radiance, and the Vital Energy Program, Dr. Taylor imparts authentic knowledge and practical tools that inspire, educate, and empower us to be a healing force for positive change. So join us and take your life and our planet to the next level. Hello and welcome to Episode 77, From Confusion to Concentration, The Science of How to Stay Focused. How many things right now are pulling for your attention? Your phone, email, Facebook, some even Twitter. Your to-do list just seems to keep growing and not going away. What happens is you become confused as to what to do next. In today's episode, I'd like to discuss the cause of distraction, how our brain chooses to focus, and give you six tips to develop and stay focused. As I've mentioned before, modern technology has given us so many amazing things, but one of the most profound mind and brain changing side effects of this technology has always been its ability to intrude into our space, whether we invite it there or not. And what that does is it creates a confused, distracted state of mind. Distraction is rooted in our desire to be included, where I had always mentioned FOMO, fear of missing out and being liked and accepted. We're led to the beeps and rings from our notifications. This energy spiral is endless, and of course our focus diminishes, depleting our vital energy and ultimately our happiness. The great news is that I can provide you with some skills to keep those negative side effects away while still enjoying what technology does have to offer. It's been reported that the average office worker is distracted. It's been reported that the average office worker is distracted about every three minutes or so. And according to research from the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, it can take up to 25 minutes just to regain our focus after being distracted. Many of us who do meditation realize that too. Once a thought takes us out of our realm, it really takes a while to get back. Losing focus is very easy, and we all know how easy it is. It's getting back into that state of one-pointed focus that's hard. And as I mentioned, if we practice meditation, we can really attest to this because we know what that feels like. Yet, despite knowing the energy draining potential of being led to distraction, we do very few things to protect ourselves from it. And the reason why is it becomes a neurologically ingrained habit. And what starts off as an innocent fun activity becomes that which enslaves us to the dependency, stupefaction, and fatigue of distraction. So what does science tell us about how our brain chooses what to focus on and basically how to control it? Your brain is always on 24-7. It takes in the happenings from the mind, namely from our information that we get from our sense organs and the mind itself. And this means we're constantly having to make an effort. Yes, as I mentioned, an effort to choose what to pay attention to and what to filter out. Neuroscientists call this selective attention and it comes in two different mechanisms. And I teach this concept in our resilience training. And for those that have not taken the course, this will be new to you, but if you've taken the course, it's going to sort of be like a review. We have our top-down regulation and what some people term in that as, or term it as a voluntary focus. And this is, you know, really the best way and the best of the best when it comes to mastering our focus. Top-down focus requires awareness and the ability to contain and hold our energy. And it's responsible for stepping back and viewing whatever is happening as an observer. And that's what meditation allows us to do, to step back. You're able to see the bigger picture and not get caught up with identifying the situation and creating a personal association with it. Because when you engage this part of the brain, namely the frontal cortex, that's for our focus, we're able to use the higher levels of mind functioning to figure things out. You know, an example of this is if you're given a situation at work that requires you to make a decision. You'd be making that decision based on what's best for yourself and the entire team. 
involved in the situation rather than feeling threatened, have to be on top, or you have an emotional response to it. The emotional response is coming with the next I'll talk about from the bottom up. But when we go from the top down, we're able to override that fear and flight and fight response that comes. And it's very subtle. It doesn't have to be some overt behavior. You know, note I said that emotional response. And so that leads me to processing from the bottom up. And that's a stimulus driven emotional focus or an emotional response. It's a reaction. We become, instead of uh, responding from the top down, we become reactive. And when a feeling happens through this, through this happening is a thought creeps upon you because we get a feeling and something around us steals our attention. It's almost like if in a very mild way, a ping, a bing, a notification, someone knocking at the door when you're in still silence. But your emotional center gets activated because it sends a signal based to the fight or flight survival response. And because the desire is so strong, whether it be the need to be safe, be liked, included, any of these human emotional habits, what happens is a signal can cause this alarm reaction to happen in the brain. So the bottom line is lack of focus is rooted in desire that causes this bottom up processing where we focus on our likes and dislikes, pleasure and pain avoidance, pain meaning emotional and physical, but we're working in the emotional limbic centers of the brain. And you just can't help but to be lured away of what's happened to what's happening. So sometimes, as I said, you hear a loud noise or somebody yells or you, you know, get a social media being and you just jump, you lose all your focus. So we have from the top down, which is engaging the response mechanism or the bottom up, which is engaging the reactive mechanism. So when we train our mind through meditation, our perceptions change and that change with that change, we're able to override the tendency to use our brain from the bottom up versus the top down. Bottom up focus or processing is based again on our fight or flight or flee. We want to get away, fight or, or flee from the issue. Loud noises, sudden, you know, movements, certain encounters will create this for us, depending on where our perceptions lie and how our mind is really trained. And in your primal mind's opinion, that's that danger mind, our reptilian brain, danger takes priority over what we're going to do at the same time. It's either, you know, in in the animal kingdom, they're working on the fight or flight. They're not sitting back and saying, whoa, wait a minute, let me step back and respond accordingly. And research has shown that the more we practice being distracted, the harder it is to get back on track. But I have to say, yoga science has also shown us that there are ways to train our focus and willpower. And where when we are distracted, we can get our focus back as quickly and efficiently as possible. And so what I'd like to turn to now is a few of those tips, six methods to help you get your focus back. You know, if you've ever been trapped in a no focus infinity loop, you know, it's hard to get out of it. It just, we, and then we get exhausted and we can't get back. We, we've lost all our energy to actually get back to focus. You become exhausted and then we wait till tomorrow and we'll try again. So here are some, um, some helpful tips that I've used in the past and used with clients and students to help get your thoughts in order. Work within a schedule. One of the most important trainings of the mind is to have a schedule. You've, you've probably noticed that you're able to stay more focused even at different times of the day. Some people are more morning. I find morning is much easier if I've had the proper nourishment throughout the day and use the right herbs and the, li- and the right uh, nutrients to keep my brain uh, functionally nourished and at the same time being able to work with the mind. Uh, We find that our peak of distraction is usually between after lunch and 4 p.m. And the crash comes around 2, between 2 and 4. And that's when our, you know, biologically our sugar levels can change. You know, your brain handles the cognitive loads best in the early to late mornings. I usually, for me, it's between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. But it depends on when you get up, when you go to sleep, when you eat your meal. So it's not as easy as 
we might want it to be, but each person is unique. There are generalizations that we could make, but it really depends on what you're doing. What, what food are you using to focus, you know, for the day? Focus seems earlier, as I said, in the morning, but only if the brain is properly nourished and on a schedule when you can take a break and go for a walk in the afternoon. So create a schedule that works for you. Second, train your mind for staying focused. A focused mind trains your brain, not the other way around, since your brain learns by doing, which means the more you engage in distractive behavior, like checking your email or your text messages 10 times a day, 10,000 times a day, the easier it will become for you to continue to engage in it. It becomes a habit. And once it becomes a habit, you've trained your mind to feel good at being distracted, but that needs to stop. Instead, train your mind to stay focused by catching yourself before you create that depleting habit. Each time you feel yourself being distracted, stop, and you'll soon become aware of this and it won't go down the rabbit hole too fast. The harder you make it to become distracted, the more your mind will stay focused. The third, take breaks to breathe. People say chew gum, it helps you focus. Do not chew gum. It actually depletes your vital energy due to the breath. And I'm not going to give a talk on the breath right now, but chewing gum is just, you know, giving you something to do, but it's not really training your mind. So take breaks with breath, real breaks. While most of our lives you know, are revolved around receiving as much input as possible, having, I know sometimes on my web, you know, when I'm working on the computer, I have 10 tabs open at once, you know, the emails, the phone calls, the messaging. Well, that's okay. We try to work as fast as possible, but it doesn't help us work. We have to do just the opposite. One of the greatest things that I learned is when I was writing my book, Feeling Good Matters, I decided I would not engage in the outside world until noon every day. Now, other people don't have that flexibility, but I at least set that schedule for myself and I was able to get it done. And I found I was much more happy not having emails work, just things, because my mind does want that attention and what's going on and, you know, talk to some fellow friends and students and, you know, we are social beings. So that is very alluring for us. So to strengthen your focus, find a place that's free from distraction, whether that's a different part of your room, your house, a cafe without Wi-Fi. The point here is to give your mind a chance to come back home to its home base, come back home and recharge. And when it recharges, it becomes very happy. We step back and we become at peace. That's the third, take breaks to breathe. Do one activity at a time. Multitasking, you've heard others, I haven't made this up, is actually a misnomer. It doesn't mean that we, you know, what we think it does, that we can get a lot done. Our mind is unable to focus on more than just one thing at a time, skillfully and efficiently. In fact, when we multitask, we're just switching from one thing to another. We become very distracted. And the more we switch, the more energy we use. And the more energy we use, the less we have to stay focused on what matters. So make a list of, a list of tasks. I use some software programs for that that need to be done in order of their importance and stick to it as much as possible. The less you try to do it once, the better your work overall and the more healthy your mind will be and you'll be more pleasant to be around. You won't be running around or not really engaging in people who are talking. For those for those humans out there that are still talking to others and not just texting, you know, when we're talking to humans, it's nice to pay attention, not think about the 50 things that we have to do. And the fifth is to be engaged in everything that you do do. If you're not with the task you love, love the task you're with at the moment. I didn't make that up. I took it from, I think it was an old Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young song where they used to say, if you're not with the one you love, love the one, the one you're with. I mean, how profound is that? Learning to be content with what is in front of us rather than always looking for something else. We learn to be in the moment. And this does in certain require training. And for sure, it's not for the ordinary mind. It's for one, it's for someone who really wants to be in the peaceful state of a content mind. When you don't believe uh, or like 
that task that you're doing, it is uh, very important to take time and really either walk away from it and don't do it or really learn to overcome the likes and dislikes and just pay attention to what you're doing. What happens is your brain will begin to process in a different way and your mind will become at ease. Outward tendencies of mind is what creates mind wandering. And the nature of the mind, you know, is to employ the senses to be in the outside world. That's why I'm not, I don't teach in the meditation practices. I don't just teach a mindfulness on our sensory happenings because our sensory happenings are actually endless. The mind is employs the senses and their senses all over. And the more aware you become, the more refined even those sensory uh, observations become. And that's fine, but then let's go beyond and bring into focus so we don't exhaust all our energy on sensory wandering because it does become exhausting. And then we reach for a stimulus, whether it be caffeine, sugar, or careless talking about someone or something that's just not good for us to get that stimulus back. And the last, number six, is to practice meditation. Meditation brings the mind inward. It's the inward journey. The mind, as I mentioned, employs the senses to experience the outside world. So we use breath as the focus because it also gives you a beneficial or a benefit uh, physiologically as well as emotionally due to how it's connected to the nervous system and brings our mind and body together. Without breath, our mind and body would not be together. So we use breath as the focus to bring that mind back to home base into a restful and rejuvenating space. There are places to learn this systematic skill for you to practice and 10 minutes per day will get you on the road to focus. So finding your focus makes life a lot easier and happy for you. And by the way, for those around you, because you're present. Using these tips that I've mentioned, all six of them, and I'll review them for you, work within a schedule, decide what schedule will work for you and stay to it, stick to it. Train your mind for staying focused, and I can guide you on how to do that or where to go if you choose to do it locally or with me. Take breaths with your breaks. So take breaks to breathe because many times we're just going along and we don't really focus on the very element that was given to us called breath that can actually help us master our life and take real breaks with that. And do one activity at a time. That's number four. Number five, I mentioned, be engaged in everything that you do. If you're not with the task you love, love the task you're with. Otherwise, don't do it. And the sixth that I said is to practice meditation. I prefer focused awareness so that we learn to train our mind, training the energy of the mind, because the energy of your mind is the essence of your life. It creates, you become the architect the builder of your life. As always, I always say, do your research, see what works for you. And keep in mind, and I'm going to ask you again, if you like the podcast, share it on my YouTube channel. You can go there and subscribe. We need a few more more subscriptions and then we can build our community even further and share it if you like it. I'd really appreciate it because it'll help support my efforts providing this content for you and it will help support our community. Also coming June 4th is a new webinar series that I'm working on now, Food to Focus. What do we need to eat to focus and how is our food prepared and what type of energy does food create beyond the macro and micronutrients to help us focus our mind? I'll be discussing more nourishing principles using both Western and Eastern models of medicine. So sign up soon. And that brings us to the end of this episode. And the Susan Taylor podcast does come out every week and is available on YouTube, the SusanTaylor.org website, iTunes, Stitcher, and other podcast platforms. And visit SusanTaylor.org for more information. You could sign up with Food to Focus at drsusantaylor.com for further information and to register. And you could also email your comments to me feedback at susantaylor.org. I would love to personally hear from you and include some of the things that you'd like to hear in our podcasts. 
And until next time, I'd like to say, remain calm. Thanks for listening and see you next time.